Welcome back to One Healthy World. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll from the Exam Room Podcast, joined as always by my co-host with the most from across the pond in London, Dr. Gemma Newman. So good to see you again this morning, Gemma. So good to see you, Chuck. I'm very, very excited about this one because we're talking all about heart health today huge topic. You know, when it comes to heart health and heart disease, correct me if I'm wrong, it is the number one leading cause of death here in the United States. How does it compare where you are? Yeah, it's exactly the same situation here, Chuck. Number one cause of death, followed by cancer. So it's really important and something that we probably don't talk about enough in terms of prevention. And that's why this is such an exciting episode, because if it's going to be our number one killer, we need to know more about how to prevent it, right? No question about it. And like so many families, this one hits close to home for me. Heart disease just absolutely runs rampant. As a matter of fact, I never even had the opportunity, not to be a downer to start the show, but I never had the opportunity to meet my grandfather, my father's father, because he died of a number of heart attacks before I was even born. Um, oh. And so it's it's really critical that we get this information out there so that others don't have to experience that same fate. So let's bring some hope and some inspiration to the table on One Healthy World today. And man alive, have you seen the lineup of guests that we have today? I mean, we're talking about some of the leading experts when it comes to heart health will be here with us today. It's phenomenal. I can't wait to get started. And also just to echo your sentiments, heart disease runs in my family as well. My grandfather died suddenly of a heart attack whilst he was just playing tennis. And sadly, my father as well died very suddenly of a heart attack and he was in his late 50s. So this is something that I am hugely passionate about. And also I myself had a raised cholesterol um, many years ago. And I'm really excited to report that I have managed to normalize my heart disease risk factors um, through starting a plant-based diet, which is one of the very exciting things, which is why I'm so passionate about this today. And yes, we have Columbus Batiste joining us, who is an interventional cardiologist, and he is also the co-founder of the nonprofit Healthy Heart Nation. And he's also completing his first book, telling us all about a physician's guide to healing a stressed and broken heart. So we couldn't have anyone more perfect to talk to us about this today. No, that's that's my guy right there. That is absolutely my guy. We also have Dr. Robert Osfeld from New York City at the Montefiore Medical System up there. Um, he is going to be joining us. And and here's the thing. This guy is an all-star, and I think that every guy who's watching us is really going to enjoy the segment because he's talking not just uh, about heart disease, but how that can uh, kind of correlate to erectile dysfunction as well. Ooh la la. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and Christine, our culinary wish, she's going to be here with some heart-healthy foods to get you going in the right direction there in the kitchen. And then get this, Dr. Newman. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Akil Taher. And this is a gentleman who had his own heart issues, had operations, heart attack, and then, and then what did he do? Changed his what diet, changed his life. He goes <laughs> and he starts climbing mountains and running marathons. I no mean, way. you want to talk about a 180, Dr. Newman. The guy is extraordinary. Wow, I can't wait for that one. And uh, now I know who we're finishing off with, and that is very exciting. We have a physician after my own heart. He is Dr. Luke Wilson. He's also a GP, a general practitioner, just like me. And he is board of directors for the Australasian health promotion charity, Doctors for Nutrition. He's going to be talking to us about how we can actually reduce our own risk factors through his very exciting research that he did, the broad study. So I cannot wait to get into that with him. What a lineup. Huge. And oh, by the way, Dr. Neil Barnard is going to be here having a conversation with Dr. Dean Ornish, the grandfather of all kinds of heart healthy research, you know, so I'm very, very, very excited about what it is that we're about to do. And I can't keep a lid on this any longer. So let's go ahead and bring on our first guest, Dr. Columbus Batiste, who is joining us on the West Coast of the U.S. My friend, it is so good to see you again. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. How are you both? Doing fantastic. Even better now that you're here, my friend. Um, I wanted to talk to you about reversing heart disease. You heard uh, Dr. Newman talk about it running rampant in her family. Hits close to home for me as well. When somebody gets handed this diagnosis that they have heart disease, you know, what kind of options are they facing? And 
is it truly, you know, reversible as we've kind of inferred here at the top of the show? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'll tell you, the evolution of heart disease and its impact into the psyche has really evolved over time. From from one of the greatest events or the worst events when President Eisenhower got struck with uh, heart disease, it was a death sentence. So we've come a long way in terms of technology and knowledge. But I'll tell you that alone the same time as, as, uh, as Pritikin, who was diagnosed with coronary disease, there really was this explosion, not only of technology, but also of the awareness of the power of nutrition. And it's not so much about semantics of reversal or not, it's that we can actually, through nutrition, help you feel better, stop the symptoms of angina, improve the shortness of breath. And here's the key. We know that through nutrition, it can actually reduce and decrease, eliminate that disparity in terms of the occurrence of heart, to, of heart attacks and death, which is the most important key component and hence why we say reversal. I think that's a really important point to make. And also, like you say, we've come a long way because I remember looking at research from Norway, even sort of just after the Second World War, when heart disease rates were soaring, um, people were kind of having a very um, meat heavy diet. They were smoking heavily as well. There were some simple public health measures where the government helped the people of Norway to reduce their smoking, improve their um, fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, etc. And they saw big reductions in heart disease in that population right so it's it's something that we're actually doing quite well with when we look at some of the situations that we faced even a few decades ago absolutely there was a great research that was done even before preceded Pritikin by someone named Lester Morrison who did work out of uh, Loma Linda actually and compared and reduced and transitioned towards uh, a plant-rich diet and he showed even early in the 1940s and 50s that you can have a decreased burden of cardiovascular events and increased survival. So this has been around for quite some time. Hmm. Let me ask you this, Dr. Patisse, say somebody gets the diagnosis and the doctor says to the patient, like, look, your artery is about 95% clogged. And this person has been eating bacon for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, and double cheese pizza for dinner every night for decades at this point. If they eliminate those foods, take them right out of the diet, and then they immediately switch to a whole food plant-based diet, or even just make, you know, three quarters of the change, get 75% of the way there. What's going to happen, do you think, to that 95% blockage? Well, here's the key thing is that we know first we have to differentiate if that person's having symptoms or not. Uh, and if they're in the throes of an acute heart attack, if they're not, we know we have time. And in that time, we know that we can, through dietary changes, can decrease some of that inflammation that lipid core that's there can potentially decrease, which means it improves the perfusion or the blood flow to the heart muscle. And that's one of the key things, because I'll tell you, Chuck and Gemma, you know, we understand the fact that most heart attacks happen from areas that are 20, 30, 40 percent. Everyone thinks it's a death sentence for a 90 percent blockage. It's actually the 20, 30, 40, 50 percent are the ones that cause the most damage. And that needs to be stabilized through nutrition. Wow. So so why is it that um, when you've got more blockage, it's, it's actually more stable? Are you able to explain that to our listeners? Absolutely. So, I mean, if I go back into my uh, my backyard and I start digging up the, the, the ground and I have a mound of dirt that's there and I kick the dirt, what's going to happen? It's going to crumble. But if over eons that dirt has been solidified in its rock formation, almost like the Grand Canyon, you kick that Grand Canyon, what's going to happen? You're going to break your toe. And so it's the same thing. When you have this buildup that takes place over time, the cap, the cap of it becomes solid and it's hard. It's immovable. When it's thin and it's less formed, it's more inclined to erupt like a pimple. And when that happens, boom, that's when the, uh, the eruption occurs. That's when the heart attack trans, uh, begins to take place. Let's see if we can give some practical tips here. Somebody's watching this right now. We, we just talked about the bacon and the cheeseburgers and the, and the pizza, but what are the other foods really that we should be looking at to take out of the diet? And what specifically would you recommend? Basically, what's in your kitchen right now to make sure that your heart's pumping as healthfully as possible? Yeah, no, great question. So real quickly, I think the key things are preformed, pre-chewed foods, I call them. 
ultra processed foods, the things that melt in your mouth, not in your hands, the things that stay on the shelf and can last a thousand years. These are the things that disease is made of and studies have shown this, borne this out time and time again. In combination, meats and ultra processed foods are the things that drive disease, burden and inflammation in the body. And if we can remove ourselves from that, that's beneficial. Where are the key things to transform? Dark green leafy vegetables, powerful, power, power punch, berries, uh, give you rich anti uh, antioxidants, help fight the stress in your body, onions, spices of life. Those are the key things. So I keep my cupboard filled with dark green leafy vegetables, berries, grains, and beans. Those are the staples to every single day when I'm leading my busy life. Thank you so much, Dr. Batiste. I love your voice. You're so soothing. And it's a wonderful way to sort of move on to the next segment as well. You talked about the spices of life and Dr. Ostfeld is going to talk about, well, the sperms of life because he's going to try and help the men, our, our listeners, <laughs> to avoid erect erectile dysfunction and hopefully uh, teach us all a little thing or two about what we should be having more of on our plates. <laughs> I know. I love, oh man, Dr. Osfeld. And and here's the thing, Dr. Newman, the, the sperms of life. Oh my goodness. Okay. Th that's a new one to me. I don't even know where to take the show from here. Uh, I will just tell you that Dr. Osfeld actually came on the exam room um, one time. And the episode that we did on this, on erectile dysfunction and food, has well over a million views right now on YouTube because a lot wow. of people are curious about this. They're like, I don't need to turn to a little blue pill. Instead, I can turn to a little green leaf. Like, let's do this thing, right? And so uh, he he coined it the erectile dysfunction all-star. So I'm really curious to see what he has for a follow-up. We're gonna be speaking about erectile dysfunction. Now, erectile dysfunction is the inability to achieve or maintain an erection satisfactory for sexual performance. It's quite common. In certain studies, the male Massachusetts aging study, about 70% of men over 70 had erectile dysfunction and about 15% of men in their 40s and 50s did. However, in my experience, it is more common than that, uh, in part because people are just not all that comfortable speaking about it, so they don't necessarily report it as much. But in my clinic, in my clinical experience, it is more common than that. Now, the reasons to have erectile dysfunction are numerous, and they fall into two broad categories, organic, and they call psychogenic. So psychogenic can be um, anxiety, depression. Organic would be vascular, neurologic, uh, drug-induced, hormonal. The most common reason to have erectile dysfunction in the Western world is vasculogenic. And the same kind of risk factors that cause trouble with blood flow in the blood vessels in the heart cause trouble with blood flow to the penis. And we actually call erectile dysfunction the canary in the coal mine for heart disease. Why is that? Because the artery to the penis is smaller than the artery to the heart. So by the time you have disease or blockage in the artery to the penis, causing erectile dysfunction. It's very likely that you also have cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels in the heart that have just not yet overtly manifest as heart disease. So the canary in the coal mine. The good news is there's a lot that we can do to help prevent it and to help treat it from a lifestyle perspective. Um, and certainly a more healthful dietary pattern more vegetables, more fruits, is associated with having less erectile function. And in fact, having erectile dysfunction in one study is associated with about a 40% higher hazard of mortality. In a Canadian study, each serving of fruits and vegetables a day is associated with about a 10% reduced uh, uh, odds ratio of having erectile dysfunction. Um, and in randomized controlled trials, eating a Mediterranean style diet, which compared to a Western style diet, so the Mediterranean style diet is more, although not completely plant-based, with exercise is associated with imp or improved erectile dysfunction 
um, across a, a number of different uh, studies. So eating more plant-based in those randomized controlled trials is associated with improving erectile function, as is uh, weight loss and exercise. So erectile dysfunction, the inability to attain or maintain an erection satisfactory for sexual performance. Um, the most common reason to have it in the Western world is vasculogenic and the same kinds of risk factors for heart disease like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes is also associated with having more erectile dysfunction. The same disease process in the same blood vessel tree. We call erectile dysfunction the canary in the coal mine for heart disease because on average three to five years after developing erectile dysfunction, one may develop overt heart disease with a heart attack or angina and there is a lot that we can do with diet, more vegetables, fruits, Mediterranean style dietary pattern. Exercise and weight loss either help prevent or improve erectile dysfunction. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you today. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Osfeld. That was a really useful segment. I know that all of our listeners will find that useful. And now we're going to move straight on and have a very special uh, segment of the show. We're going to be talking about food from the portfolio diet. Now, the portfolio diet was put forward by Dr. David Jenkins, a very well-known food researcher, nutritional researcher, and it's an evidence-based approach for helping to reduce our risk of heart disease. So we're going to head on over and speak with Anne to find out more about what you can do with the portfolio diet. Today we're talking about the portfolio diet, aka how to add some special effect foods into your life. Ta hey friends, it's Anne from Veggie Minifique, your go-to for holistic wellness and a healthy vegan lifestyle. So what is this portfolio diet and what are the special effects? In short, the portfolio diet is an evidence-based eating plan for lowering cholesterol and hence lowering your risk for heart disease. It all started with Dr. David Jenkins at the University of Toronto, who found that a portfolio of foods could accentuate the cholesterol lowering effect of a plant-based diet. The key is, in addition to avoiding animal products as well as oily foods, of course. You emphasize the following foods for even more bodacious results. First up, viscous foods. Viscous? Yep. So that's oats, beans, lentils, berries, and chewy yum-yums like barley. Hello, fiber. So eat these foods like they're going out of style. Next up is plant protein. So we're talking about soy milk, tofu, tempeh, beans, and other soy meats like veggie burgers, for example, and nuts and seeds. Now you don't need to go nuts here. Just a sprinkle of nuts on your salad or maybe a tablespoon of peanut butter in your oatmeal and you'll be all set. So now I'm going to share a simple meal plan for a day that's rich in portfolio goodness. So first up is breakfast. Now breakfast is probably the easiest and also my favorite. So go for some oatmeal with a scoop of a nut butter as well as some berries topped with some soy milk. Not into regular oatmeal? Fair enough. Why not make some oat pancakes? So in a blender you blend up some oats, some banana, baking powder, and some soy milk, as well as cinnamon or vanilla if you'd like. And then spread on some PB and you're golden. Next up, lunchtime. So for lunch, we're having some hummus quesadillas. Hummus, corn, black beans, que rico. And for dessert, some cashew yogurt topped with some berries. Snack time. So one of my favorite snacks is just carrot sticks and hummus. Easy peasy. But if that's not your thing, how about a strawberry banana smoothie with a little bit of vanilla, silken tofu, and soy milk. Now for dinner, the possibilities are endless and beanie, but may I suggest a delicious Thai peanut burger made with quinoa, chickpeas, and of course, peanuts. So what about dessert? I got you. So for dessert, we're having Veggie Minifique Devonshire Coconut Chew Cookies. After eating these portfolio foods, you may feel like running around like a superhero. So don't say I didn't warn you. Take that, cholesterol. Pow, pow. 
Thank you so very much, Anne Christine. Always a whiz in the kitchen. I love what she brings to the table. And I also love what our next guest brings to the table. This is a gentleman who was really facing death, staring it smack in the face and said, no, 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 no. This is not my time. And not only did he stare death in the face, he completely changed his life. He went from himself having a heart attack and heart procedures to climbing mountains. And oh, by the way, he did this well into his 60s. I'm so glad that he is here today. What an inspiration he is. Dr. Akil Teher, thank you so very much for joining us here on One Healthy World. Thank you, Chuck. It's an honor to be here. And thank you for that kind introduction. You are more than welcome. And what I love about your story, not just your transformation, but you you yourself are a doctor and you 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 practice and you own Doctors Medcare in Gadsden, Alabama, um, heart disease survivor, as I said, and then you go on to climb mountains and run marathons. Like who does that other than you? It's just such an incredible story. I want to start with this though. Um, as a doctor, as a physician, somebody who's very keenly aware of their health, um, what happened to your own health that put you in this position where you really yourself started to experience these symptoms of heart disease? Yeah, Chuck, let me give you a little synopsis. See, I came to America rather late in my 40s and had a lot of catching up to do. So I paid very little attention. I worked very hard, paid very little attention to my health, family, and friends. And I spent most of my time eating unhealthy food without worrying about the unhealthy consequences like heart disease. Like many, I believed it would not happen to me. So like a moth to a flame, I was drawn to meat, eggs, dairy, processed food, oils, sugar, and this was necessary for me because like an addict, I needed this to get my daily high. And then apart from this, I was at that time called a seafood eater, S-E-E. -E. I ate everything at sight. And then on top of it, I was a couch potato. I had no sense of any exercise. In fact, the only exercise I did was for my eye muscles looking at joggers run in the park. <laughs> On top of this, I had a type A personality. I had to have everything under control. It was my way or the highway. So it was not no surprise, Chuck, that I got heart disease at a young age of 56. Honestly, I was terrified. I had, like Dr. Is said, at 98 to 99% blockages of my uh, coronary arteries, two of my arteries. Now, had I known then what I know today, I would not have gone for surgery or stents, but they advised me stents. And my plaques were so thick that they had to use a diamond tip drill to shave off the plaques. And in the process, I got a cardiac arrest. And they had to shock me to get my heart beating again. Uh, it just, it struck me here. This is a part of your story with which a lot of us are, are not familiar. They had to use a diamond tip drill to clear out some of that plaque. And I mean, that is significant blockage that if you need something with that strength, that blockage had been there for quite some time. Absolutely. It takes decades to form a plaque like that so that it does not break off easily. And I had angina, I never had a heart attack. So the point I'm making is that even though with this coronary, in spite of the coronary artery disease, I did not change. I continued my poor lifestyle choices. And that led me into sadness, uh, despair, depression. And all these negative thoughts became more and more and got me more medical problems. So now I had sinuses, bronchitis, and your uh, infamous diverticulitis with perforations in the colon, holes in the colon. And that is, it, picture this. My friend, the surgeon, was standing over me in the operating room and telling me, Akhil, if I don't operate on you right now, you may not survive. So this continued for five long years, devastating years. And that is why when I turned around and said that, look, I have to make a change, but I was back 
back into the hospital because my stents had failed and now they had to have open heart surgery. Mark and mark my words, I'm going to do a half marathon within a year of my surgery. This is what I told the nurses in the ICU as they were wheeling me into the surgery room. And I don't know, Chuck, why I said this, but looking back, I believe that this was a subconscious decision that I had only two choices left, either to continue this horrific, you know, uh, end of journey life with uh, mediocrity, anger and despair, or to make a conscious decision that I have to do something with my life, lead a healthier life, eat better and move more. Boy, did you ever. I mean, from that day with that statement, you're going to run a half of a marathon. I mean, you just rolled out the red carpet for change. When did the idea of eating a plant-based diet first pop onto your radar? So that was it. My, my recovery was remarkable. I was on the treadmill on the third day and I did everything. And then within seven months, I ran up half marathon and my bruised heart took me figuratively as well as physically across the finish line. But having said that, I was still getting diverticulitis, not that often, you know, regurgitation, heartburns. And I was wondering why was I doing something wrong? That is when it, the bell uh, no rung. And that is when I realized that, look, I have to figure out a way to find out a way to heal the body without solely relying on on medicines and surgery. And that is when I started reading books by, you know, lifestyle medicine experts, my colleagues like Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. T. Collins and uh, Dr. Dean Ornish. And the more I read, the more I realized that there was something in this. That's when Chuck, I realized that I realized the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And the most important pillar was the diet apart from sleep and exercise and uh, stress reduction and uh, uh, social support as well as avoiding abusive substances so to me what you eat is more important than exercise and i believe the whole food plant-based diet was the one thing that was extremely important in my six pillars because being a septuagenarian athlete and running marathons and climbing mountains, I realized with this diet that I was getting more energy. My preparation time, my performance time, my recovery time all improved tremendously. So in end, I would like to say that thinking healthy, getting healthy and staying healthy begins and ends by what you eat. And I have one more question from you. How in the world did you go from, I'm going to run a half of a marathon to I'm going to climb some of the tallest mountains in the entire world? Who does that other than you? I, that's what I love so much about you. It was, it was, you know, no stopping then because I was enjoying myself doing it. And the more I did this, in fact, when I did my 100 mile bike ride, I was on a total whole food plant-based diet. And I was, I spent nine hours on that bike in a gale force winds at 30 degrees. I came back and uh, uh, six hours later to my small town. And next day I did 10 hours without wetting an eyelid at work because there was no doctor available. So it just is, it's this diet that opens your mind to other things, cruel to, cruelty to animals, global warming. All this led me to start thinking about, hey, I've got a lot of things in me. And I tell people, I am not 75. I am just 15 years old. That's when I started my life. You are such an inspiration, Dr. Taher. Thank you so very much for being here. We'll talk with you again in just a minute. Your book is Open Heart, and I encourage everybody to go ahead and pick that up at their local bookstore or on Amazon right now. Such a phenomenal read. Um, right now, though, I have a big treat for you. And I want to play a clip of an interview that Dr. Neil Barnard did. He actually uh, was, he usually gets interviewed. Well, he kind of turned the tables on Dr. Dean Ornish and conducted the interview himself. And so what I want to do 
is play a clip for you from this interview where the two were discussing the origins of Dr. Ornish's transformational work, really showing, perhaps on the largest scale for the first time, that when a person is diagnosed with a heart disease, it doesn't necessarily have to be a death sentence. And you don't necessarily have to wind up on the operating table like we just heard from Dr. Taher. Instead, these lifestyle changes that we talk about so much here on Healthy World can, in fact, save your life. I was learning how to do bypass surgery when I was in medical school with Dr. Michael DeBakey, who was one of the people who invented the procedure. And we'd cut people open, we bypass their clogged arteries, he'd send them home, and he'd tell them they were cured. And then more often than not, they would go home and do all the things that caused the problem in the first place. They'd you know, smoke cigarettes and eat junk food and not manage stress and not exercise. And more often than not, the new bypasses would clog up. So they'd come back and we'd cut them open again, sometimes two or three times. So for me, bypass surgery became a metaphor that we were literally just bypassing it without also treating the cause. So I wondered what would happen if we really did treat the cause. So I went to the library and began to read kind of voraciously and found that in, in dogs and cats and pigs and rabbits and monkeys, you could cause them to get heart disease if you fed them a, an unhealthy diet and stress. And you could reverse it if you change those things. And I thought, well, why should people be any different? And so I did a pilot study at that time of 10 men and women, put them in a hotel for a month, put them on this program, and most of them got better. And they not only felt better in terms of their chest pain going away, but the blood flow to their heart improved. <clears throat> and then based on that, we did a series of randomized trials showing for the first time that, as you say, our bodies often have a remarkable capacity to begin healing if we can treat the cause. And the cause, more often than not, are the lifestyle choices that we make each day. And we publish these in the leading peer-reviewed journals. And over time, Medicare agreed to cover my reversing heart disease program, first in hospitals and clinics, and now they're covering it virtually. So now we can reach people in all 50 states wherever they live, and that'll really help reduce health disparities and health, equi health inequities as well. Are there specific individuals whose experiences really moved you? There are. You know, one of the biggest obstacles that I find, and I'm sure you do too, is that people think, oh, you know, diet and lifestyle, that's kind of boring. How powerful could that be? You know, it's got to be a new drug, a new laser, a new surgical procedure, a device, something really, you know, high tech and expensive to be powerful. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high tech, expensive, state of the art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low tech and low cost interventions can be. And probably the ultimate example of technology and, uh, heart disease is a heart transplant. And we have a number of patients whose heart disease was so bad, they were told that only a new heart could save them. And one guy, I'd like to show you just a minute and a half video, uh, is an internal medicine doctor himself, had a massive heart attack, and again, was told that only a new heart could save him. And so while they were looking for a donor, he went through my reversing heart disease program at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles for nine weeks to get in better shape for the heart transplant surgery. But his heart disease improved so much during that time, he didn't need the heart transplant. So like, what's the more, the more radical intervention here? A new heart or eat well, move more, stress less, love more. So let me show you uh, his example. So the situation I'm describing here is of an internal medicine doctor who started a new chapter in his life with his wife, moving to Lake Arrowhead, having just opened uh, a private practice office after all of our kids went to college and we could relocate and just as this was ramping up, we had a horrible car accident which precipitated a heart attack that dropped my cardiac functioning down to basically uh, 11 uh, to 13 or 14, 15 percent of what it should have been, which resulted in intractable chest pain, angina, trouble breathing, inability to walk from room to room, go upstairs without being carried. I was offered a heart transplant as the only way to stay alive. And at the 11th hour, I entered the Ornish program, which provided me with the, an entire paradigm shift with respect to stress management, exercise, diet, nutrition. And despite not believing it myself and having other physicians who didn't believe in it either, it uh, worked beyond my wildest dreams. I'm now able to exercise moderately. I can work full time. I can live at 6,000 feet and uh, our quality of life is actually better than it was before. 
Can you believe that? I mean, what a perfect example of what all of this can do for a person. We've heard two phenomenal stories now here on the show. And Dr. Newman, I, I want to bring you into this. I mean, I was going to make a joke about usually when you put a group of people in a hotel, it's a party. But what Dr. Ornish did was literally change the world and save countless lives at this point. Can the gravity of his research be overstated? Yeah, that's a great question, Chuck. I think looking back at that uh, segment was just really emotional for me because uh, the testimonial that he shared, he had a he had a, a car accident and then his, it precipitated his heart attack. Well, that's exactly what happened to my father. He had a mild car accident and then he had a big heart attack and died. But obviously, my father's outcome was not the same as the one that was shared in that video, which is why it was, for me, so powerful. And I think... That's why this kind of message is so important. You know, there's this, there was this major trial, the Interheart study published in The Lancet, which is the same journal that published Dr. Ornish's research. And they said that they, they followed 30,000 men and women from six different continents. And they said that the vast majority of heart disease is preventable through simple lifestyle changes. And that really gets me because this is these are incredible stories. These are the stories of our families, Chuck. This is your story. Mm -hmm. This is my story. And just being able to share the fact that these simple diet changes, simple exercise changes, reducing stress, not smoking, basic things that you think kind of feel a bit boring actually is the stuff of miracles. It really is because it changes lives for the better. Wow. That's a powerful quote. You know, the things you think are boring are really, you know, the stuff of miracles. And it's, it's so very true. And again, for me, it kind of goes back to what it is that we're taught just fundamentally as children and then quickly dismiss as we get older. It's that, you know, eat your fruits, eat your vegetables, eat healthy and go outside and move your body. You know, and if you just do those simple things, I mean, boom, there it is. That's the prescription for health that somehow with the life that the majority of us have designed for ourselves, we've completely forgotten or neglect on a daily basis. And so if we just get back to those fundamentals, what better shape we'll all be in. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why I'm so excited as well to share some research um, that's actually a bit more modern. It's a bit more up to date. Um, we have the incredible Dr. Luke Wilson joining us from Wellington in New Zealand. And he's going to share with us a bit more about his groundbreaking research, uh, the broad study that was published. Um, I think, was it 2020, Luke, that it was published? Uh, 2017. Oh, oh my goodness. So yeah, it was actually so a little bit older. <laughs> a little bit older. Perhaps that's when I heard about it. But I was really excited by it nonetheless because um, it was quite an unusual study. It's one that was close to my heart because, like me, you're a GP and you work with real patients with real problems, um, people who um, may be carrying extra weight, may already have heart disease, may already have diabetes, and you were able to help them turn that around. So I'd love to hear more about your research um, for One Health world. Yeah, sure. So actually, it was great to see uh, Dr. Ornish there before, because one of the things that really inspired us to do the research was um, Dr. Ornish's research and also the work that we were aware of um, from uh, Dr. Corboy Assalston too. So, um, and funnily enough, the plan of the trial in the first place, although it's often spoken about as a weight loss trial, and we had some amazing results in that regard, um, we were actually interested in um, in reducing cardiovascular risk factors, and that was how we designed the, the study originally. So we took a group of about uh, 30, well, it ended up being 65 patients total, um, and we randomized them into two groups, and we had them in a community setting, um, meaning that uh, we got them to come to some sessions twice a week for 12 weeks, um, those were, were in the intervention group. And they learned all about uh, whole food plant-based um, eating pattern and lifestyle and how to implement that. And we had some really practically focused sessions for them. And then um, with the other group, um, they acted as, as a control group. And so we took participants who had a, they were either overweight or obese, and they also needed to have either one of type 2 diabetes or a history of ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular risk factors being high cholesterol, high blood pressure. 
so so you basically had to have one of those conditions and or be uh, carrying extra weight in order to be eligible and what my understanding is is that there was no requirement for calorie counting and no requirement for exercise as well during the study is that correct 100 percent. so that was uh, one of the things that the participants actually mentioned that they enjoyed the most about it um, it ended up being a group of people who had tried all sorts of things for their health and um, and basically nothing had worked for them. And so this was their opportunity to try something different. And one of the things that they kept saying to us time and time again was that they really um, enjoyed and appreciated that they were, weren't feeling hungry all the time. So they were able to eat too, um, they were satiated or feeling full. And um, they, they really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, and so what did you, oh, sorry, Chuck, you go on ahead. No, it's it's all. I'm I'm just curious. Like with with the participants in the study, I'm thinking back to when I was still over 400 pounds. Um, just my eating habits were were just so poor. Would I be correct in assuming that the participants here were also largely eating that high fat, fast food, fried food, junk food type of a diet that's so prevalent among so many of us? Yeah, for the most part, um, that definitely described some of them. Uh, but the interesting thing was, is because of the way that we went about selecting them, is we actually did get individuals who are a little bit more interested in their health. So quite a few of them were trying things already uh, and probably had a healthier than the average New Zealand diet. So I think um, that kind of adds to the uh, to making the, the results that we ended up getting in the end a little bit more impressive even. Yeah, absolutely. Because these are people who had just, you know, already been trying to do the healthy thing. And it does speak to the power of a whole foods plant based approach. So, so tell us a bit more, what exactly did you find? What were the findings of the study? Yeah, so the, the main uh, publicized finding is that we had a weight loss of, um, of 12.1 kilograms um, after six months, which uh, for those of you using pounds is around about uh, 26, just under 27 pounds and that that was maintained at uh, 12 months. So remember that the intervention, which is when we're actually spending time with the participants, was over after three months. Um, so six months and 12 months were follow-ups. And um, same with the 12.1 um, kilograms. So they ended up being about 11 and a half kgs uh, on average at, at uh, 12 months, which showed that they more or less maintained um, those changes and that weight loss that they had achieved during that time. That's that's huge. As a guy now who's 13 years into his weight loss journey, I can tell you that it's not just losing the weight, it's keeping it off. And that's where eating this way really does come into play. It's not a fad diet. It's not a yo-yo diet. It's something that can really help you maintain that weight loss. Are you keeping up with any of the participants? Are you doing any sort of long-term follow-up? Yeah, so the, we extended the trial out to three years. So some of the results were um, kept in, kept, we kept in touch with them for those. And uh, there's also, you know, some of the participants that have sort of kept in touch with personally and a lot of them doing very well still. Love to hear That's them. great. And there's so many trials and interventions that are only over after three months, six months. It's wonderful to actually see that those results, uh, even a few years later, have been able to stick. So really inspiring. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Man, what, what a great study that is. I mean, that just gets me all fired up. Again, not just about losing the weight initially, but keeping it off. And the more data, the more research that we have, the more excited uh, I get and optimistic I get um, about the work that we're doing here. And Dr. Newman, I know that as a physician yourself, I mean, you just got to be like busting at the seams to continue to bang the drum for this message. I am. And it brings me a lot of joy to um, have a chat like this with so many other inspirational physicians and, and dietitians and nutritionists, because we see the power of this, how, how life changing it can be. And, you know, as you and I've discussed earlier, it's something that is personally important to both of us. So, um, yeah, I'm just so excited to see these changes. And also in my own life, as I mentioned to you right at the beginning, I was able to bring my own cholesterol down to normal levels using the power of a whole food plant based diet. And I had eaten healthy 
regularly before. I had been fitter, arguably, before. I was running every day. I was eating lots of chicken and fish and salads. And yet my cholesterol was raised. My cardiac risk factors were high. And to be able to bring those risk factors down using the power of the plate is something that, yeah, I will definitely keep banging that drum about. All right. Well, we have a a couple of minutes left here on the show, about three minutes left. And I want to welcome everybody back because we've talked a lot about food, but I want to also talk uh, about the component that kind of exercise has here and merge those two together. And Dr. Batiste, I want to kick off the discussion here with you. And that is really, you know, how do exercise and cholesterol coincide? Is it possible for somebody to eat a Big Mac and then hop on their bike and pedal that cholesterol right out of their system? No, that's a great question. So we know, Chuck, that you're not going to exercise off eating a bad diet. But here's the crazy part about exercise, the power of it, is the fact that there was a study done probably about 10 plus years ago that compared exercise to angioplasty stenting. And what we found is we found that individuals who underwent, who engaged in exercise, intense exercise, had better outcomes, reduced uh, angina and burden and lower cost. And so the power of exercise is truly a hidden uh, supercharger to your event. But the core component is still your nutrition. That's really good to know. And also, uh, we, we've got the uh, amazing opportunity to speak to two other practitioners who are part of the show about what they do with their own patients. So, uh, Dr. Teha, can you tell us a bit more about uh, any top tips you'd give your patients in terms of practical things they can do to reduce their risk of heart disease? Mike? You're muted, my friend. I believe very strongly that every primary care doctor should write a prescription of exercise at least 30 minutes a day for five days a week. Moderate intensity for people who can do it or at least for a brisk walk. Now, I also believe that exercising is not only decreasing your good, uh, increasing your good cholesterol, but it decreases your blood pressure. But my point is that if you're doing it for feeling good, your endorphins, that is okay. But if you're doing it for cardio, then you should get your heart rate to 70% of your maximum heart rate. Meaning that if I am, say, uh, two, that is 220 minus your age. So 220 minus my age, 75, is about 146, 150. I should get 70% of that, which should be about 104, 106, 108 for cardio. So that is my another important thing is as you exercise, going on exercise, your heart rate will decrease and your heart has to work less to get the oxygen into your cells from the blood. So there are so many different advantages of doing this. But like Dr. Batiste said, you cannot outrun your diet. Diet becomes first. Number two is exercise. And Dr. Wilson, the honor of the final question goes to you today, my friend, and that is with the participants of your study, um, how many of them, even though the focus primarily was on nutrition, how many of them really embraced healthier lifestyle habits outside of what it was that they were consuming? How many of them then decided to start lacing up their sneakers, going for a walk, eventually starting to run as well? Well, the interesting thing, Chuck, is we actually didn't see any differences um, between the groups and and how much physical activity they did. But what we did hear from the participants is that many of them were managing to get back into activities that they hadn't been doing for a a very long time. So once they had the success with the weight loss, um, that really gave them a lot of confidence going forward. And they felt like they could be getting back into, you know, playing football and um, going to the gym and so forth. So sort of one thing led to another and and the the, um, positive changes they got just from the dietary change um, really made them feel like they could succeed in other aspects of their life, which I think was, was really exciting for them and also for us. Yeah, that's one of the most exciting things about being a physician is seeing those changes in your patients. And I'm sure that every single one of our panelists would agree. That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us, um, you know, in this path is to see those results for our patients and to watch them be able to do the things that they'd always wanted to do. No question about it. And and to be able to get your life back like that is just, you can't put a price on that. That is literally mm. priceless. And 
that surge of confidence that Dr. Wilson just mentioned, Dr. Newman, is so very true. I mean, I used to mm -hmm. not be able to walk more than 10 feet without my chest starting to tighten up. And I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. And I very well would have at 420 pounds if I didn't clean things up. But I did get things cleaned up. 13 years later, seven years now into my, my plant-based journey here, like everything is still rocking and rolling and the confidence is still there. And everybody needs to experience not just the, the physical benefits that can come with this, but the surge of confidence and all of the cool stuff that can happen in the peripheral as well because of the transformation that you're having. It's truly inside and out. And I can't think of a better way to end this episode, Dr. Newman, than with you know just that, that sort of hope that uh, hope is not lost. It never is. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's never too late to make those changes. And I say that's my patients every day. Those with high blood pressure, those with high cholesterol, you can start today to see some improvements that could change the rest of your life. So yeah, really excited about this one. Yeah, I love this episode. Thank you all so very much for being here. This has been a fantastic 50 minutes with you all and, and truly helping to take all of these, these topics and put it out there so that we all have one healthy world. 